Praise the Lord. Well, we are back in the New Testament. We finished the book of 1 Kings and uh, we do one book in the Old Testament and then one book in the New and then we go back to the Old again so that uh, we get refreshed on both sides. And uh, sometimes we go to and fro, we miss one book or so. Uh, but uh, now we remember that when we get back here, we are now in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. <coughs> So let's go to God in prayer and thank God for all that He has done in our lives. Father, we thank You for the Holy Spirit who is in our midst. We thank You, Father, for all that Your Holy Spirit seeks to do. We thank You, Father, for all the wonderful things that You are doing in our lives and that You will be doing in our lives. We ask, O Father, that You continue to pour forth the spirit of wisdom and revelation Grant that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, that we may know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in a sense, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. We ask, O God, that you continue to show us all the wonders that are in the salvation. Or sometimes when we thought that we have understand, yet when we look at you and we grow in you, We know there's so much more that we do not understand. And so much more that we can grow and learn in you. So let it be so tonight, Father. And reach us in all that Christ has done for us. And especially ask, Father, that your angels and your Holy Spirit will pour forth gifts in our lives. And that you will cause us once again to marvel at the great salvation that is in in Christ Jesus. And the greatness of this wondrous salvation that was hidden from all the other ages but is not revealed in these end times. All that you want to do in Christ, Father, we thank you. And Father, even tonight as you unveil our eyes, cause us to see even more that is in Christ Jesus, cause the spirit of worship to arise in our lives that we may gaze upon you with greater love that we may fall deeper in love with you, that our first love for you may not remain stagnant, but it will grow even more and greater. We are here because we love your word, and those who love your word will indeed be blessed. We thank you, Father, for these blessings of yours, the greatness of your blessings, and we ask, O God, that even tonight we will experience you afresh in our lives. For you are the living God, and you watch over all our lives. We give you thanks, we give you glory, praise, and worship. Glorify your Son, Jesus, in our midst, and confirm your word, as always, with signs and wonders. Let every sickness that is in in our presence, that is under the sound of, of your word, even today, melt under the power of the Holy Spirit. Let every demon force, or every oppression, Flee before the sound of your word. Magnify the word of your power. And we will glorify you all the days of our life. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. <clears throat> well, we are back in the book of Ephesians, a book that we have taught a lot all over the place, quoted a lot. And sometimes you wonder, what else can we learn from the book of Ephesians? I can promise you one thing. Each time we reread the Bible, you will find something new. No matter how many times you read it, you can read it a thousand times. Each time you will find something new. Uh, and uh, the book of Ephesians and Colossians were written about the same time. Uh, and especially Ephesians, together with Colossians, they expound the greatness of this salvation that we have. And I doubt that we fully understand uh, the greatness of this salvation that we have, the greatness of our position that we have in, in Christ Jesus. And as you look at the book of Ephesians, uh, just want to bring to mind that uh, Watchman Nee has an entire book on the book of Ephesians too. We actually have a verse-by-verse exposition of Ephesians also. I'm not sure whether we have put it online, but I remember doing a translation of Ephesians from the Greek and then did it verse-by-verse. That was uh, decades ago probably by now. Uh, but Watchman has a book uh, on Ephesians and it's called Sit, Walk, Stand. If you ever came across that book, Sit, Walk, and Stand, 
He took it from the book of Ephesians, where in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, we seated in Christ Jesus, in how many places? And then by the time you reach uh, verse chapter 3 and chapter 4, especially chapter 4, chapter 4 talk about walking in love, walking in the light, and walking in the wisdom of God. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of walking that is that done. And then in chapter uh, 6, where when we wrestle against principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places, in uh, Ephesians 6, 12 onwards, and having put on the whole armor of God, it says, having done all, we stand. And the word stand is emphasized three, four times within a few verses. Uh, having done all, we stand. And uh, standing and standing. So, they sit, there's walk, and they stand. And the watchman Nee was trying to talk about the Christian life. Uh, all these books actually talk about living the victorious Christian life. Sit, walk, and stand. <coughs> and as you look, uh, indeed, uh, this book does talk about our position in Christ. If we are to talk about sitting in how many places, chapter 1 and chapter 2 speaks about our position in the how many places. Well, let's look at the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says here, <coughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in how many places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, him in love. So we are already blessed in Him and we are chosen in Him to be blessed. And uh, then in chapter 2, it tells us that in Christ, we have been uh, risen with Him. In verse 4, 5 and 6, it continues the same theme. God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, <coughs> even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So there we have the sitting position. And then uh, in uh, chapter 4, and five, there is the walking position emphasized. You say here in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, uh, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. And then in verse 17, I say therefore, chapter 4, 17, I say therefore, testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of the mind, but rather teaches a new way of walking in God. Which chapter 5 continues on. And chapter 5, he says in verse 2, Walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice of God for sweet-smelling sever. Verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all godliness, righteousness, and truth. In all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And uh, not forgetting, <coughs> also, uh, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So you notice there are three areas. Walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. Walk as one who is wise in God. And by the time you reach chapter 6, where the spiritual battles begins in verse 12, he emphasized the standing in verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. And then he says, stand therefore, having girded your ways with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, and above all, he says in verse 16, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of uh, the enemy. Notice the main times he talk about standing. So, there we have uh, an overall view looking from the Christian perspective of uh, being blessed and seated in Christ Jesus, and then walking, and then we have standing. Now, if you observe very carefully, Sitting and standing are both positions. Walking is the only one that is motional. When you talk about walking, uh, there's movement that is there. 
standing you're not supposed to have any movement uh, in a very general way of course we don't mean it we were sitting there <laughs> and, uh, but generally it is a position and uh, uh, but standing has more effort than sitting so notice that there is a movement in the body of Christ since you're looking that way so let's move from uh, left to right so there is a uh, sitting walking and standing now, if you want to look at our position in Christ and our, our uh, outworking of salvation, it begins in a, as a position that you have in Christ. But it also ends as a position. But the position is a different effort. Standing is a different effort from sitting. In sitting, it's practically effortless. You could sit a long, long time. And, uh, but standing, uh, even though your nationality is coming, a lot of people will stand in attention. I, I guess some people will stand so long that they faint. Uh, some, you know, and then when you're in the army or in a uniform group, and when you're standing, they tell you, you know, you're allowed to sort of move yourself while standing, moving your toes, etc., while standing. Uh, it's a greater effort, but it's still a position. They are two different positions that we have to learn. And then when we ask about Christian life, in your Christian life, can you tell the difference between sitting position and standing position? Not physically, but spiritually. If you can't, then you haven't understood the message of Ephesians. Say, what? I have the book Ephesians right so many times. Yes. If you cannot differentiate between being sitting in Christ and standing in the position in Christ, you haven't understood Ephesians. Doesn't matter how many times you have read it. So your next question to me will be, what is the difference? Good, thank you for asking. That's why we're studying this book. <laughs> What's the difference in the two positions? That's what we're going to look at to differentiate between the standing position and the sitting position in Christ. Can you tell when your spirit man is actually resisting the enemy standing or your spirit man is sitting in Christ Jesus? Most verses say, eh, sama, sama. No, it's not sama, sama. Tak sama. <laughs> it's not the same. If you reverse the order and you're standing in Christ Jesus, and you're sitting in the enemy camp, it's a whole different thing. Obviously, that is not what and where it's supposed to be. We have to learn to sit first before you can learn to walk, before you can learn to stand. And usually when a little baby is growing, the first thing that happens to little babies for uh, us parents is the baby can control their head movement. Their neck muscles and bone grow strong. And the first time the baby can lift up the head. Before long, the baby can sit down. And then after some time, the baby can stand. And the baby can walk. Now, Standing is placed right towards the ending. Because that standing is a positional standing against the works of the enemy. Already, it tells you why many Christians fail when they fight against the enemy. Although it uses the word, the word wrestle, that in verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood implying that we wrestle against principalities, powers, wicked uh, rulers of the darkness of this age and wicked spirits in high places. That is Ephesians 6 verse 12, four different, different classes of demons. That when we are wrestling against them, the wrestling position is um, not so much a position of actually physical combat as it is uh, standing your ground position. 
And every time you win a battle over the enemy, you always win standing. It is with effortless and yet some effort because standing and sitting are different effort. If we do not know how to stand against the enemy, you will never win against the enemy. Let me illustrate some practical differences. Uh, Christian who every time they go to a place, they say, Oh, take authority, take authority, take authority, take authority. They are not standing. It is a lot of effort. Say, do you take authority different way? Or a Christian who tries to minister to someone who is demon-possessed or oppressed or demonized. In the name of Jesus, come out, come out. <laughs> a lot of effort, but there's no position. Notice, standing is a position. And you must be positioned before you can resist the enemy and cause the enemy to flee. Satan will not respect you. He didn't say, Satan will not, no, will not respect your authority if you're not standing in the position which God has for you. You have to, first of all, be standing in that position. And what is that position? It's a position of victory in the Lord. It's a position of knowing who you are in Christ. Did Jesus panic when the devil came to him in the wilderness? No, Jesus knew his position. He tried to alter Jesus' position. Notice, every spiritual battle is a battle of position. He comes with his lies, you stand on the truth. He's the accuser of the brethren in the book of Revelations. You stand cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You overcome the devil with, by loving the Lord and not loving your own life, you know, and by the word of your testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that a standing position? Every victory you have over the devil is in a positional victory. He came against Jesus and said, If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. The whole battle was not about turning stones into bread. Turning stones into bread was not the issue. If you thought that was the issue, you have lost. The issue is whether he was the son of God. Since he knows his position that he is the son of God, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm just standing in God. I have the power to do it, but I'm not going to do it. He's confident of his position. He don't have to do something to prove himself. As opposed to Christians who are trying to do something to prove themselves. They got it upside down. That's why they have no victory over the devil. They have no victory over sin, no victory over the things that the enemy threw against them. Or... Uh, uh, Justin Conwell, he wrote the book uh, on praise and worship. And he wrote the book uh, on the seven Hebrew words for praise. There is uh, Barak, there is uh, Yada, and all the different positions of praise. There are more than seven he, he wrote, but he focused on the seven Hebrew words for praise. And he talked about how in his own life, and in his own church, and in his own ministry, they used to always take authority over the devil. Take authority over the devil. At first, he gave a very nice atmosphere. They buy, 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 you know? And wow, what a great service it was. Then the next Sunday, buy, 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 buy. And they do it a few times. And in his book, you read his book uh, by Justin Conrad, Praise and, on Praise and Worship. He says that one day the Lord came to him and said, or rather he heard God's voice. He says, why do you worship the devil before you worship me? <laughs> worship the devil before I worship you? I never worship the devil. Say, oh yes, you do. You give him half an hour, 45 minutes of time. <laughs> bye, 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 bye. And then after that, then you worship me. And then he learned that that is what the devil wants you to do. Spend time with him. 
Even if he succeeds in distracting you, he already succeeded, correct? If the devil succeeds in distracting you and casting doubt, he already succeeded. He doesn't actually have to win, he just has to distract you. And you got less time. And that's when he learned to worship God. Now, I'm not saying that we do not take authority of the enemy. I'm not saying that we do not bind sometimes as a lot leads. I'm not saying that we don't take command, but you do it only as the Lord instructs, not as a formula. Because how many times did we find the Apostle Paul go to every new place and you go, bind, 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 well, somebody can compose a song on that, but better not, right, wrong one. You never see the Apostle Paul every time he goes to a new place. Bind, 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 bind. Never. He just walks into a place and he knows the authority of God. Occasionally, he might lift up his hands to proclaim. Sometimes, in, like, in the book of Acts 16, the demon keep following him. Even became the herald before him. Remember the demon possessed girl. They say, these are the men who serve the most high God. These are the men who serve the every time, you know, she, they go. Until, and she did it for quite a few days. Not just a, not just a few hours. A few days means the next day she was waiting for him. Then when they woke up, these are the men. Until Paul got very irritated. He doesn't need the announcement. Especially, don't need the devil to announce about him. And he commanded the devil to come out. To come out. They told bind, 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 bind. Obviously, I can prove in Philippians he didn't bind, bind, bind. If he actually had done that, the demon would have been silenced. But he just walked in the authority. So in our confrontation with the enemy, it is not what you do. It is not you understand your position that brings your victory. When you know your victory in God, the battle is already won. Because what happens between now to the time when Satan bowed his knees and acknowledged that Jesus is Lord is not a battle that is fought with the flesh, not a battle that uh, we will assume to be a lot of human effort. But it's more the pressure that comes from the authority of the Lord pushing upon the enemy because his people know their position in the Lord. And out of that position flow forth the glory of God. You see, it's the glory. When you are in the right position, the glory of God is upon you. Now I show one more thing that flow in the book of Ephesians to show the theme that is there. Before we go into uh, more detailed teaching, I need to show the theme that goes on. Notice in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, you're up there in the how many places? In Christ, at least. The position is up there in the how many places? Alright, since we started here. So, in the how many places in Christ Jesus? In chapter 3, it is what's happening on your inside. It's your inner man. And now, in chapter 3, in chapter 1 and 2, is your position in Christ. Correct. Who you are in Christ. In chapter 3, verse 17, it is Christ's position in us. That's a totally different thing. Now, it's Christ's position in us because our inner man is strengthened. He's now positioned in us. We are positioned in Him. He is positioned in us. See, the whole thing is about positioning. And um, can I illustrate it with um, like a radio anten antenna or radio signal or TV signal? And what is important is line of sight. The higher you can put the radio signal, assuming that all things are equal and the signal is as powerful, 
the, the higher you can put an a, a, a antenna to broadcast a channel or signal, the further you can go, the more ground. So usually, the tallest building, the tallest mountain, tallest hill around, you find that they will use that as a broadcasting station. If they don't have that, they will build tall spires where they will put a, a radio signal that can broadcast out. They need the height to gain the line of sight. And just by merely gaining the line of sight, assuming that all broadcast systems have the equal power, by the line of sight, you already dominate by broadcasting. A signal, the signal of God's victory. Your position in Christ is very important. To know our position in Christ. In chapter 3, his position inside us. His position inside us depends on certain factors. And we are told what the factors are. His position in us, and we need to allow that position, and he calls it the inner man. In Ephesians chapter 3, the inner man. It's inside us. And Christ is dwelling in our hearts. As he's positioned correctly, we receive more things from him. The word comprehend is the word katalamano, which means to receive even more from him. So we are positioned in him, he's positioned in us. And notice by chapter 4, the inner man has become the new man. In verse 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So, your position in Christ, chapter 1 and 2, his position in your inner man and apparently his position in the inner man grows and grows and grows until he's something you can put on. Say, the inner man has now grown to the new man. And the word new man, it's not the normal word like, uh, uh, it, it, the, the word kainos is new, but notice in verse 23, the word renew in the spirit of your mind. The word renew is not just the word kainos which means something new. The word renew means to take on a youthful nature. Not just new, but the strength of youth coming to you. Like Psalms 103, He renew your youth like the eagles. So the, the renewal is back to as if you have never fallen. As if, uh, and it's opposing to, you know, you know how the, the book of Romans also says, old man, old man, old man, put off the old man, put on the new man. And here, the word new man, of course, is brand new, kainos. But the word renew only in the book of Ephesians, it emphasized renew in the spirit of mind. The word renew is like putting on that newly created part of your being that that is born anew, that is like, like the youth, like who you really are in the spirit before you ever fell. So the newness is both in new and youthfulness. And, uh, so how do we get from the inner man in chapter 3 to the new man in chapter 4? Ah, that's what the book of Ephesians is trying to tell us. And having put on the new man, we will of course talk on that afterwards. Having, now the inner man is something that is growing. The new man is something that you could just put on. That means it can cover your whole being. It's not like the hidden man of your heart or the inner man. Because when you say the inner man, your outer man is covering your inner man. When you say the new man that can cover your whole being, it shows that there's something that flows out of you, like the glory of God, that's why it's emphasized. 
created according to God in true righteousness and holiness, that is not covering your being. And now you understand why he says in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. Because the whole armor of God represents parts and manifestations of the new man. And when you are positioned in God properly, he, you are positioned in Him, He is positioned in you, and the position now works out through you. When you put on the new man, you're putting on a position. You're putting on a position. Putting on the new man, when we ask many people, how do you put off the old man and put on the new man? It is the acceptance of your position. The acceptance of who you are. See, putting on, putting off, putting on, putting off, putting on is a position. When you put off your old clothes and put on new clothes, your clothes are positioned on your body. So it's a position. But instead of talking about clothes, he talked about your new man is positioned. When you put on your new man, your new man now becomes your outer man. How can you put on something unless that something is bigger than whatever co it covers? So the inner man has grown to the extent that it's now an outer covering. You can put on and then having put on, you can now walk in it. That's why the Bible says walk in the spirit, not the sp walk in the spirit. It assumes the spirit is surrounding you. When you walk in something, when you walk in water, means you go underwater and you walk. When you walk in air, means you walk surrounded by air. It assumes that you're surrounded by the newness of things. So it's a walking in that position. Thus, Ephesians 6, the battle is, the position is now being pushed against Satan. It's a positional push of standing. And that's where the victory is. So we're going to learn in Ephesians how we are positioned in Christ, how Christ is positioned in us, and how that position in us grows until it can be an outward position that covers our whole spirit, soul, and body. And then you go out in Ephesians 6 in battle. That's quite a transition in the book of Ephesians that is there. Together with that theme that flows in the book of Ephesians, um, we also notice when, you're, when, when we're looking at uh, uh, these uh, various positions that you have in God, that Building the inner man is like building your anointing within. In uh, 1 John 2.20, it says we have received an anointing within. So, it's like building the anointing within. There's an anointing within us. And putting on the new man is like building the anointing upon which is why Ephesians 4 went on to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fivefold ministries and all the gifts of the church. So at the same time, it says there's an anointing within, there's an anointing upon. And unless you master the anointing within and the anointing upon, you're no match for the devil. That's a simple answer. Jesus told his disciples, and let, do not leave Jerusalem, carry in Jerusalem until you be endued, and the word is clothed with power from on high. Acts 1, let's look 24, verse 49. Then Acts 1, verse 8 says, When the Holy Spirit has come, you shall receive power, power to be His witness. He does not expect any one of us to bear witness without anointing upon. Whether you're a businessman or ministry, he never expects us to function without an unction. He expects us to be anointed and then go forth. So every morning, before you leave your house, you should have an anointing within, anointing upon, and then you walk out. Oh. But some of us, the only thing we put on is our clothes. 
We didn't put on the spirit. No wonder, you know, it's like running naked while you'll be arrested. So most of us were not spiritually naked. We, we didn't know we had to put on the anointing every day. Say, what? Well, I thought you only put on anointing on Sunday. Oh yeah, then six days a week the devil have his hey time. And Sunday you put on, then he run away. <laughs> what kind of Christianity is this? Jesus didn't say Acts 1 verse 8 was only for Sunday. Or only when we worship. Neither did he say Acts 1 verse 8 is only when we gather in the church. It looks like he wanted the anointing upon every day of his life. And we are supposed to understand the anointing. In fact, none of us are supposed to leave your doorsteps without the anointing upon. Ah, that's the difference. No wonder some of us are leaving our house without the anointing upon. And of course, some of you are asking, how do I tell the anointing upon? If you can't tell, then you don't, don't know whether you have it or not. Is it, is it a feeling? <laughs> not necessarily so. What is this putting on thing? What is this anointing, this sense of his anointing? That's where efficiency is going to help us. See, I thought we cannot learn any more new thing from the book Ephesians. <laughs> now, let's look at some more new things in the book Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, Notice that he was praying for three things in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, he prays for three things. He prays that that they will receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that their eyes of understanding will be enlightened. And once their eyes are enlightened, they are supposed to know three things. They were to know what is the hope of his calling. And they are to know, number two, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And they are to know, number three, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the power of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, who raised him from the dead and seated him in the right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not in this age, but also in that which is to come. To know three things. To summarize it, the hope of his calling, the exceeding riches of his greatness of his power towards us who believe, and the power which he raised Christ from the dead. So three three areas of three three things. Our eyes are to be open to know three things: hope of his calling, the exceeding riches of his inheritance in Christ, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Three things. The second two things have to do with his anointing. The, his inheritance of Christ in us is his anointing within, which is Christ within us. And the exceeding greatness of his power is his anointing upon us, the Christ upon us. So one follows the other. Now, Cross-reference to the book of Colossians, for shortly. Uh, in the book of Colossians, it tells us in chapter 1, verse 27, in answer to the riches of His glory, in verse 27. Colossians 1, 27, To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in us is same as uh, is same like Ephesians chapter three. So Ephesians chapter three is the exceeding greatness of His power inside us. So that was the number two what. There are three what's inside this prayer. That is the second what. The third what has to do with putting on a new man, the anointing upon which is found in chapter 4. It leaves you with what? How do we know the hope of His calling? That is in chapter 2, when you're in the heavenly places. And apparently, they go one after the other. Unless you know the hope of His calling, you won't know the exceeding greatness of His power within us. You wouldn't be able, and you don't know the anointing within it's very hard to work the anointing upon, which is in Ephesians 4. 
the anointing upon. So in the New Testament, the anointing within is priority, then the anointing upon that you go forth. Very important. So we see the themes keep flowing through and through. And to interpret this Ephesians in a new way, we're going to bring an Old Testament scripture to help us here. And that is the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, while, while watch many has sit, walk, stand, we will now add fly, run, walk. So it's, uh, what's that one again? Crouching tiger, hidden dragon. Okay, now this one is fly, run, walk. <laughs> Affish, uh, now, Isaiah chapter 40. We are tied together in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Because it says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But verse 31, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Notice the three positions. They will wait on the Lord, and then their strength is renewed. And then they mount up with wings like eagles. Then they run and then they walk. So they are, uh, if you discount the first position, waiting on the Lord, then you have fly, run and walk. And that's what we want. When you talk about sitting, sitting, what watchman is say? Sit, walk, stand. Sitting in Christ. It's obvious that to be seated in how many places, you must be able to rise up to be how many places. It, uh, and we are raised up in Christ Jesus. But being raised in Christ Jesus, mentally we know it. But how do we experientially have it? Apparently Colossians is still on the same subject, where the book of Colossians chapter 4 tells us here, And uh, Colossians chapter 4, uh, chapter 3 first, verse 1, 1 and 2. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So suddenly it talks about the hidden life. It jump, makes you jump in verse 3 to Ephesians 3, the hidden life in Christ. But I like what he says. He says, okay, he says we are raised and we are seated with Christ Jesus. What does it mean? Colossians 3 tells you the meaning. It means that we are to set our mind on things above and not things on the earth. In verse 2, very simple thing. Now, if you bring F, uh, Colossians 3 verse 2 into Ephesians, this is how it will look like. In Ephesians 2, it is telling us to raise your thinking level and raise your man, mind above the earth. That is like an eagle soaring. Your mind takes off like an eagle and it goes into God. Not the things of the earth, but the things of God. And then, before we look at chapter 3, look at chapter 4. It talks about, in verse 23, 24, your, this mind or this new mind that you have is now on the earth and you're now putting it on the earth and you're walking in this new mind. So, when you're raised in Christ Jesus, your mind is raised. When you put on the, the new mind, that is now on earth. And in between, in chapter 3, is the hidden mind of Christ in you. 
You have the reason mind in chapter three, chapter two, the hidden mind in chapter three, and the new mind with the new man in chapter four. Interesting, isn't it? Just stretching the word mind, reason mind, hidden mind, and new mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, I told you it would be something like crouching tiger, hidden dragon kind of thing, <laughs> but not in a natural way. Now, all these words we are throwing out, and some of you say, wow, you got this word, you got that word, you got this word. Okay, how do we start? Good thing you ask. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 tells you, you start with waiting. So, it looks like he is telling us the key to the whole spiritual life. When you have a position in Christ, the key is to begin to keep going into the position and exploring that position in Christ. And like you got to live there. If I ask you this question, what's your address? Some of you will give me your, your postcode and your address. No, no, I'm not asking your physical address. What's your address? I say, well, I didn't know I got address on the spirit. Yeah, I haven't got postcode. <laughs> I'm not teasing you. No, you don't need postcodes in heaven. What's your address? Where do you live? Where's your home? Your home is in heaven. And some of us have wandered so far from home, we never went home. <laughs> some of us thought that heaven is only after we die physically. Well, if heaven is only when we die physically, then your whole life is a natural life that Satan will bully you. The good news is not a ticket to heaven. That one day you go to heaven. That's not the good news. The good news is, heaven is now your home. Now again, I know some people are very natural based. They say, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm on early good. That's an English proverb. I know what the proverb means. It talks about people who are airy, fairy, and not pragmatic and practical. But you don't have that in the Bible. In the Bible, it's the opposite. Unless you're heavenly minded, you will never have the blessings of God on the earth. Okay, let's start from A, B, C. <laughs> okay, the A, B, C. Here are the fundamental questions. Where are your blessings? I didn't say, what are your blessings? Most of us know what are our blessings. You know, you go to any church, you say, oh, these are our blessings. You are in Christ. We are rich in Christ. We are healed in Christ. We are this in Christ. I didn't, I didn't ask what the blessings are. We've been taught well enough what our blessings are. Many Pentecostals know what their rights are. Where are they? Yes, in heaven. If I ask, where's your money? <laughs> Most of you will remember your bank account and which bank. Or some of you might be very old fashioned, you're still stuffing it into your mattress. <laughs> but you do need to know where your money is. Because most of us who are practical, you keep some cash in hand. Or if you're walking about, and I say, where's your money? You know, we're about to pay for something. You reach into your pocket or into your wallet or into your purse. You know where your money is. It would be un very unusual for some of you. Uh, and we're about to pay for the food. You know, most people will reach into their pockets, their wallet or something electronic or get their card somewhere or their purse. It will be very few people that will be opening their hair up, take out some money. See, well, your money is in your hair. Okay. 
right? Oh, you know, some people, you know, they're about to pay, then they take out their shoes, take out their socks, and then eat deep inside, they take the money here. <laughs> Say, okay, thank you, let me give you the change. <laughs> you know where the location of your physical money is. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, we are blessed in verse 3 with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Which means that we need to move into the heavenly places to access the blessings. And then, you somehow bring it onto this earth and you retain that blessedness. As I thought before, blessedness is a tangible quality. When you are blessed by God, now, blessedness is the Greek word eulogia or eulogos in uh, various forms, which is different from the Beatitudes, which says, Blessed are the meek. That blessed is the word makarios, which, strictly speaking, is more like the word honorable. Are those who are these, uh, like, like God honors them. But here is the literal word blessed or blessing pronounced upon you. And in the worst case interpretation, remember I say worst case, worst case interpretation, it means lucky. And if, you, if you're a Greek scholar and you trace the most uh, hidden meaning of the blessed, it means lucky. Now we all understand what the word lucky means in its carnal form. It means that when you woke up between here and the MRT station, of all people, you're the one who find gold coins all along the way. And when you trip and accidentally fall, wow, you found a hundred dollar note. And then when you reach the MRT, everything just like the train comes just nicely. Then after you leave, the next guy go there, ah, oh, electricity failure. <laughs> but just miss you. Lucky, they call you. And uh, so and then when you, when you want to get anything anywhere, it, it seems that some sort of quality that caused good things to happen to you, happen. That's the, even the worst case scenario. But we know that's not what the word blessed means. But the word blessed is more powerful than that. It means a quality that when you could bring down to the earth, if they say, have you paid your taxes? Say, so, oh, I didn't know, okay. Hey, Peter, go and uh, fish, and then uh, after pay for my tax, and your one also extra go for you. And you put down, of all the fish they had to buy, that day, angels had to work underwater. Because whatever bait was put out by Peter, and the angels would say, hey, you got gold coin, not, cannot buy. You there, you there. Say, okay, the fish with the gold coin come, you're the right one. Either that or you send the fish to get two gold coins. You want to eat this one? You sacrifice your life? Thank you for the Lord Jesus. So all the fish are volunteering. What were they? I volunteer on the die for Jesus. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then the fish are qualified. Okay, you go and get two gold coins and come and sacrifice your life here. And the fish come out, gold coin. And not only that, the first fish. Maybe you got other fishes for lunch. But Jesus was so exact. The first fish that comes up, pay your tax and mine. Well, Jesus keep his money all over the place. <laughs> Most of us keep in the bank, Jesus, he you knows know where all the gold coins are in the oceans. This quality of blessedness is there. Jesus had no light. He asked his disciples. He says, when you went out two by two without any, have you any light? They say, no. Because of the quality of blessedness. The quality of blessedness also keeps you from sickness and disease and death. To access it, you must access it up there. And for some reason, the only wallet and purse it can contain in is our spirit man. This blessedness has to be contained inside the spirit man. So our spirit man goes there, we have to assess that blessedness and you spend time in that blessedness and that quality that is already yours and you sort of draw it 
And then you fly, you come down. And you come down running, and you're not weary. And uh, running is a type of, um, in spiritual sense, the only time you see running in the Bible is in chapter 12, where it talks about run the race with patience. So in a sense, it's talk about a, a, a spiritual walk also, but it uses the term running. And uh, to run the race. And uh, so as you hit down, the blessing of God is still in your life. And continue to flow forth. And even when the enemy resists, you stand your ground. Blessedness against cursedness. Because cursedness loose. Because blessedness. You can see that the enemy before he can overcome you, must make you cursed first. Cur to be cursed, because I'm stretching a word, some people just say curse, but to be cursed is to have the quality of attracting the bad things, the opposite of blessedness. Why is it that Balaam was asked to curse the Israelites by Balak? Why didn't they just go out into battle? Because they know you cannot battle against the blessed people. You will lose. But if the curse comes on them first, and then you battle, there will be loopholes. The enemy cannot come against blessedness. Blessedness is more powerful than cursedness. And thus you can see the whole picture of bringing that blessing and you're standing against the curse of the enemy cannot come near you. And if the curse cannot come, the enemy cannot win. He cannot put one thing upon you. The only time he succeeded is where the line is redrawn. And you see an example of that in the Old Testament. It's not going to happen again, but only that time in the Old Testament in the book of Job. In Job's lie, the line of blessing was redrawn. It was redrawn twice. Because God says, Have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan challenged Job, challenged God and says, He only serves you because of the good things you bless him with. If you take away the good things, he's not going to serve you. And the devil even admitted. He says, you have put a hedge around him. And all that are his. You know the hedge is not only around Job, about everything of his children and everything that are his. So the devil was complaining. And that book was written for a lesson to show that nothing could happen to Job as long as the line was not redrawn. Try as he might, nothing can happen. He can send the Sabians, the thousand lightnings. It will all bounce off. The blessedness was that. When God redraw the line with just one word, he said, all right, but don't you touch his life. What did God do? What exactly did God do? He redraw the line and let the devil enter into, a, into the arena that he never entered before. Immediately, the disaster started happening. Lightning came down, destroyed all his flocks. His house came, the strong wind blow, the house fell down, all his children died. And the Sabians came and this attack and that. All kinds of horrible things happened. Cursedness started happening. Because the blessedness line was redrawn. And then, they will still don't want to give up. Because Job's, he couldn't touch Job's help. And God allowed him to even take his help. The line was redrawn, but God says, don't take his life. And Job got sick. So sick. You see, the curse came on him. And uh, when that happened, it was because God allowed the line to be redrawn. 
Because some of us are wondering, will God redraw the line? Not in the New Testament. That was Old Testament before Jesus came. See, now we are in the book of Ephesians, which never before has this blessedness ever come upon any group of people before. Even Abraham was just the germ or the seed of what that blessedness can, can be. This blessedness in the book of Ephesians, we are told, look at, look at this blessedness, okay? And you begin to see this picture of this blessedness that we need to have. Uh, it says in, uh, let's read Ephesians 1 again, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, incidentally, the word blessedness is from the root word eulogio. Eulogio is a combination of two Greek words. The word eu, which means uh, good. So the next time something you say, eu, or you mean Greek eu? <laughs> It means good. <laughs> anyway, I know to the ladies it means something horrible. Ew! Right. Anyway, the word you means, means good. <laughs> so the next thing is, ew! You mean the Greek you or the expression you? <laughs> and uh, like euangelion, good news. And uh, you carries good grace, which is uh, representing in the communion. And so you have here, eulogio, which is good word. So literally, the word blessing is from the word good words. God has spoken good words over our life. Shoom, he has spoken, and nothing can cancel that. So it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, past perfect tense, with every spiritual blessing, not just one or two, every spiritual blessing. And you wonder whether they include natural? Yes, because every natural thing is moved by spiritual things. You read Hebrews 11 verse 3, you realize that all that is natural is framed by the things that are spiritual. So when you say every spiritual blessing includes natural blessings of prosperity, natural blessings of health, natural blessings of uh, good luck or good fortune, natural blessings of opportunity. This is the blessedness. When you've got blessedness come upon your life, it's powerful. Now, here is your choice. Whether you don't want to fly like an eagle or a soul like an eagle go up, your life is not made from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. Your life is made from Isaiah 40, verse 32. Hey, say God, verse 32, don't have. <laughs> the blank spot between chapter 40 and 40, 41. Say, what would that be? It would be that you didn't have the eagle part. Now, if you didn't have the eagle part, you didn't have the waiting upon God part, you didn't have the eagle part, and you're trying to run, and your life will actually be Isaiah chapter 40 was 30. Even the young men run and get weary. All your strength. Every day when you wake up, you're not thinking of getting blessedness. You're not thinking of tapping upon blessedness. See, that's the secret of the Christian life. Now you realize. Every morning you get up, you're thinking, oh, dress up and go to work. Of course, some of you say, wow, if I could tap on like the eagle, eh, what time must I get up? In the morning, okay. I give you a few clues to at least encourage you. Sometimes, like the eagle, you can gather for the whole week. Say, whoa, whoa. So you spend Friday all night, and whatever time you spend with God, you saw like the eagle. And it lasts. It actually lasts. And all night prayer lasts for some time. Which is why I, I almost, you know, not, um, not f so much a word from God, but I know, I would tell people, if you spend all night regularly every week, there's a momentum that you build upon your life. That comes upon you in ways you never experienced before. Look at, example, Eddie, you know. He's sitting like a prosperous man Hallelujah, praise the Lord. From the blur, blur, cannot see, cannot worry, he started to experience the things of God. He's seen God bless your son, right? Good school, good, everything seems to flow together. 
Things sometimes that you may ask or did not ask, your wife now start functioning in gifts of the spirit. Wow. I was telling Eddie, watch out, no, your wife overtake you. No, no. But and I, that was one of the things I guaranteed Eddie, because Eddie is wanting to grow in God. I said, Eddie, you just follow, just keep pushing through week by week, pray in tongues. And you see the overflow of the blessedness. So the good news, I understand, we all, this is Singapore, everyone work like ants. No need that, MLT time people work like ants also. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen in a rush hour, the way people walk? Oh, I have seen Singaporeans walk, let no other people walk. Unless, of course, I haven't gone to Hong Kong or China yet, they told me it's even faster. <laughs> right? So, oh, some of them walk like running on. <laughs> oh, I say, praise the Lord. <laughs> I think if any faster, they need headlights and horn. You know? <laughs> so, and it's, 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 you see these, all these people running all over. And I understand, you know, some of us don't have that much time and all that. And you can only do a bit of devotion here, a bit of devotion there. But put yourself on a weekly schedule. If you can't do it on the, on the, on the, on the a daily schedule, but you put yourself on a weekly schedule to seek the Lord and to, to, to amass, touch that blessedness. Touch that blessedness. And so he says, every blessing, it is only in the heavenly places in verse 3. In the heavenly places. That is why when God uh, wants to bless us, he says here, that he has made us accepted in the beloved. And... Um, and it says here in chapter 2, what is his goal? It says in uh, verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which he loves us, he has raised us up together. What is the purpose of raising us together? Look at verse 7. The purpose why he put us in the many places is so that in the ages to come, which means this age and the many ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us. God wants to show us His kindness. And wasn't it David who say, Thy loving kindness is better than life. Now question, why is the loving kindness of God better than life? Because one work of God's kindness can set you up for life. One breakthrough, one business breakthrough can set you up for life. One spiritual breakthrough, you could be called to be a missionary, you're called to be a prophet, or called to be an evangelist. One major breakthrough, the whole world knows you're called to be an evangelist. Your ministry got more demand than you ever can, can meet. His acts of kindness set you for life. That's why they are better. Life depends on His kindness. So it is important to seek and be in that position. And so it's all in the heavenly places. He to show us this loving kindness. And um, in fact, in chapter 3, it becomes His wisdom uh, to us. The unsearchable, in verse 8, the unsearchable riches of Christ that He wants to show to all. Uh, and in verse 10, what is God trying to do? God is actually, if I can use these words, not in a wrong way, but in, in an honorable way to God. He wants to show us off to all His creation. This is what I mean when I say I'm going to bless my people and love them. That's what we were called to. In Christ, in verse 9, he says, Which from the beginning of the ages have been hidden, but now in verse 10, to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We are to demonstrate to all the principalities and powers, where? In the heavenly places, that we are part of blessedness. And look, the challenge to us is also in the heavenly places, but on the negative realm. In chapter 6, verse 12, we are fighting against 
or wrestling against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So the battle is to prevent you and I from reaching the blessedness. Now you know why standing is standing. And even though the word wrestling looks like we are wrestling, but in fact, it says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against, implying that we wrestle against. But yet the wrestling against is more a standing. How is it a standing? Because you're standing in your position of blessedness. He claims you're cursed, you claim I'm blessed. He curses you, you declare praises and blessing and love. So his cursedness cannot come near you. Just like Balaam found it, they could not curse the Israelites. And isn't it true in med uh, medieval times and even among some cultures that believe in, in spirits and in ghosts and in the spiritual realm, that before they come against a person, they try to curse a person first? Whether a person, a nation, or business, or, or thing, they try to curse first, and then they attack you. Because they must remove your blessedness before they can attack you. They forgot that this blessedness can never be done away with, cannot be taken away. And that's the blessing of this, these things that God wants to bring us into the spiritual dimension. And tonight we want to talk about how to access this blessedness. We have to raise our thinking. It says, in Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, if you were raised in Christ Jesus, he says, set your mind on things above, not on things below. It is very tough. Many people find it hard to give up the natural thing. Give up worrying about natural thing. Give up thinking about natural thing. But unfortunately, this must happen. Because these belong, imagine there are planes, right? Yeah, one plane, two plane, three plane, four plane, five plane, etc. The natural things belong to the lower plane. It is correct when you come down to that level, you think about that level. And you be responsible at that level. But you must be able to leave that plane when you rise higher and higher in the spiritual dimension in God. To be able to leave those thoughts behind. Jesus didn't exactly say in that manner, but Matthew chapter 6 implies it. He says, take no thought. He says, do not worry about the things of this life. What is he telling us? Because we are all humans, we are all natural based, we got a lot of, and the more responsible we are, the more hardworking we are, the more we are concerned about this life. He understands, but he's saying, when you pray, just for a moment, take every thought away from this life. Because it is this life that is bogging you down. Let your spirit breathe fresh air of the spiritual dimension. And you breathe the oxygen of heaven, the blessedness of heaven. And you strengthen yourself. And then as you strengthen yourself, then you come down again. And then you could do all those things you need to do on the earth. It is necessary to give up natural thinking just at that moment of prayer. Because when you come face to face with God, it will be very funny when you come to the throne of God and all the angels and the archangels and the, and the Zo Zohar beings of God, all the glory of God, and all the universe with the multiple galaxies and worlds, all, you know, being, being, being uh, cared for by God. And then you come right before God, throne, and you bow and say, God, I would like a t-shirt, please. <laughs> it's just in our place, right? That's what it's like. Asking for natural thing. Now, God does care for us. He cares for us even to the detail before you even think of it. He thinks of it. But here is the part. If we are willing to give it up for a moment and just enjoy His blessedness, enjoy His presence and let it soak into you. That's what the word 
in Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, They that wait on the Lord. In order to launch forth as an eagle, one must come in brokenness to him. Waiting on God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, Isaiah 64 verse 4 For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by the ear nor has I seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him And Paul takes that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and replaces the word wait with the word love in chapter 2 verse 9. I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. To Paul, waiting on God and loving him are the same. So what do we do when we are waiting on God? We need to take time off just to love God. Just to be with Him. And in prayer, you ascend on your praises and your worship and your prayer to God. Like an eagle taking off. You have to see it from God's perspective first. The hope of His calling must come to you. We must see what he sees. And as like an eagle arising into his throne, you have a whole view the way God sees it. Before you land and run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Before you can come down to that perspective. And it's all different perspective of God's love. From chapter 1 to chapter uh, 6, it's all different perspective of God's love. Look carefully again at how love is used and the word love is expressed in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1 and chapter 2, it talks about how much He loves us. You see, it says here that we were chosen in Him, before Him in love. It's God who first loved us. That is true in verse 4. He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So He has chosen us in His love. And then in chapter 2, verse 4, God who is rich in mercy, because of His great love, which He loved us, so this great love that he loves us with, he wants, to, he wants to pour his love. In other words, waiting on God is come and let him love you. Just let him love you. Let him surround you with his love. Let him fill you with his love. Come and taste of his love again. If you have been far away from God, remember I say, that is your address. His love is your home. Heaven is your home right now. Not when your, your, your body dies. Right now, every night, if you have to say a quick prayer before you sleep, say, thank you, Lord. I'm going home now. And then you, you could just soar into the heavens of God's love. And the place to just be loved by God. And... That's where your address is every time. And uh, then you come down to this earth each day when you wake up to do all those mediocre, menial tasks that you have to be faithful in. But even throughout the day, your spirit saw to contact Him, to touch His love, to touch His love, to contact His love. So in Ephesians 1 and 2, he loves us, He loves us, He loves us. Now, we thought that, okay, we now got to love Him back, right? But before you can love Him back, you got the in-between section that say, you must grow 
put your roots into His love. You can't love Him yet. Not only must you be loved by Him in how many places, but when you come back to the earth, and now is your position in Christ in how many places, now you come down to the earth, you are still rooted in His love. Now, rooted in His love and grounded in His love, what does rooted and grounded mean? It means you never move away from that love. Even though physically we are not like plants, we can walk from one place to another, no matter how far you walk to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, you never walk away from His love. You, are, you always sense this love. You're rooted in this deep sense of His love and His kindness for you. And you know roots can be different levels. The more rooted you are, the more healed you are in Him. The more secure you are in Him as a person. You don't, and you don't need other people's love to make you feel better. You don't need acceptance from others to make you feel uh, less inferior or to feel that you're no longer inferior. Because you're deeply rooted in this love, which is Ephesians 3, where he says this emphasis on love. Now, when you talk about the width, the length, the depth and height, it means you're totally surrounded by this love. This tangibility of his love, and this one sounds very theoretical. But I can assure you, it can be a very real experience. If you have never felt the tangible love of God, after you have met God, and you come down to the earth, this tangible love that flows in you, it can move you in different ways. I have no need moving in people so much so that when they see people, they just feel the love of God towards them and weep for them, a cry for them. Of course, uh, it's so strong that we cannot hold on to it all the time, but it can be very strong and tangible. This width, length, depth and height, this tangible love that is there and, and this love that surrounds you in how many places, now you bring this love to the earth. You bring the same experience and now Christ is dwelling in our hearts and He being love and by personification of love comes to us and look at verse 19. This, this knowledge of the love of Christ. This experiential knowledge which passes knowledge, passes intellectual knowing. This knowing, this love of Christ is, um, is beyond what one person can comprehend. That's why it says, together with all the saints, that uh, somehow when we gather with saints who are touched by God's love, that love increases. Together with all the saints, we're going to experience more and more the love of God. Like, uh, like we might not have all, we didn't all didn't come from the same background. We all might not have lost a son like you have lost a son. But when you hear of how God love still cover you even though you lost your son we share in that love that God has when uh, not all of us might have gone through very deep and horrible sickness or disease and survive but we can hear our stories of somebody had does and touched God's love and God's love pulled them out from the brink of disaster when we share in that love it increases our love so together with all the saints the word Comprehend is the word kata lambano. We receive with all the saints. Even more, the length, the breadth, the depth, the height. Because one life is not enough to tell the story of God's love. Jesus personified that love in His one act to die on the cross for us. We need trillions and trillions of life. Each life telling a story of God's love to really see and comprehend God's love, to, to, to understand how greatly God loves us. Then when we see the story of the man who is born without arms, without legs, 
all he has is one stump of a f- foot, right? And uh, I realized he was an Australian. And, uh, and yet, he, in spite of his handicap, he experienced God's love. So what do you feel when you see God's love on him? We feel, wow, God loves. See, together, we need trillions and zillions of stories, individual, to tell of God's love. It enriches us. So we bring God's love to our practical life and when we never forget the moment of God's love and it's in that love that we bring, that we grow. And then it talks about loving other people in chapter 5. Then by the time you reach chapter 6, you're still full of God's love. How can the devil win? It says, perfect love casts out fear. No wonder all you have to do is stand and the enemy flees. Even James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Verse 8, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not, not you run from the devil, the devil run from you. Because you have fulfilled verse 7, you are drawn near to God. Can you imagine a Christian life where everywhere you go, the devil flees. Why is the devil not running from people? They don't have this blessedness, this love. They didn't touch on this tremendous love. They bring, didn't bring it down to earth. And when you bring it down to earth, the devil flees. The devil runs away. He cannot stand in the atmosphere of God's love. He, he cannot. He runs from it. Demons are scared in the atmosphere of the pure, unadulterated, unconditional, tangible love of God that God demonstrates. So it all starts with waiting. And then you saw up and you touch and you contact that love. And then you let the love position in you. And you build upon that love and as you let the love build upon you it is still God's love it is only in chapter 5 that you are asked to walk in love yeah the love is coming out from you but we are still being built into God's love we are drawing on His love in order to flow forth heaven is not heaven without love the thing that makes heaven heaven is God's love. The atmosphere of God's love. And that atmosphere we can bring down when we are filled with His love. And when we worship and understand His loving kindness. So understand the patterns that are there. There is not much effort in the running and the walking if we understand our position. It is more the position. If you position correctly, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, it's just positioning yourself. And your victory over the world is by steadfast position of your life. You maintain that position year in, year out, like a, like a tree planted by the rivers of water, Psalm chapter 1. And year in, year out, you position yourself in God. Sooner or later, the fruit will come. So many Bible verses, the book of John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus said, He is the vine, the Father is the vine keeper, we are the branches. Abide in Him and let His words abide in us. We will bear much fruit. What's the emphasis on? Positioning in Him. Christian life, there's something that Jesus has done. Jesus has changed the doing into being. And look at the contrast in Ephesians chapter 2. He say in verse 2, We once walked according to the course of this world. 
You see, we were action people. We were always walking, walking, doing, walking, doing, working, walking, doing, working, walking, doing. But when you come to Christ, you are just being. And out of the being, the doing is automatic. It comes naturally. There is still doing, but the doing comes naturally. Look at chapter 2, and we're close with that. Chapter 2, we'll cover this the next week in uh, verse uh, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Then he says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And then, in chapter 3 and 4, he talks about how he created us in Christ Jesus for good works. He built our inner man until we are able to put on the new man. You see, he's building into us. And until your inner man is built, your outer man's efforts are useless. So we are building the inner man and we are his workmanship. We are created for good works and which God has prepared that we should walk in them. Notice, it is not so much you doing the work as you walking in the works. And walking has been the easiest of all exercise, if you want to call it. Walking is the most natural balancing position of your physical body. Running is a different thing, which we'll touch on the next way. But walking is almost effortless. Your body was made to walk in order to balance. And works is no longer working the works. But it's walking the works. Because the works have been built into us. We are His workmanship. Created for good works. He made us for the good works. And then the good works flow out through us. That's why it's easy. And the Christian life is that way. It must be built into our inner man. And then it grows strong until the anointing upon comes as a gift. Then we put on the gifts. Put on the anointing upon whatever level of anointing He has given to you. And you might say, I have no anointing. Not all anointing upon is fivefold ministries. There's an anointing for everything even if you didn't know it. Sometimes you didn't know there's an anointing. I'm sure doctors in the Bible didn't know that she was anointed to make clothes. Say, what well, making clothes got anointing? Yes! When the anointing comes upon it, oh, the clothes you make... <laughs> Powerful. Who knows, you might have an anointing to bake cake. <laughs> anointing to make biscuits. <laughs> you never know. Say, wow. I didn't know I can have anointing. You read the Bible, the type of anointing, sometimes people go to discover the anointing. What did David say? David was a king and a warrior, right? He said, it's God who strains his hands to do war and to bend a bow of bronze. He said, it's God. Learn to be like David. When he was a shepherd, he said, The Lord's my shepherd died. You know? When he was a warrior, say, The Lord's my warrior. When uh, uh, he was a king, The Lord is my king. It's very clever, isn't it? He knew where the anointing is. So if you're an engineer, The Lord is my engineer. If you're an artist, the Lord is my artist. If you're a businessman, the Lord is my businessman. Well, you didn't know. Well, you think you're better businessman than the Lord. Huh? No. Think, look at the way David think. He learned that all good things comes from the Lord and every perfect gift. And humans might invent new employments, but the original source of all creativity comes from God. And we know that some jobs, you know, uh, completely disappear as society changes. 
today you don't have a town herald going around. Oh, no, announcing the news. Why people get their news by the internet nowadays? Even newspapers are dying. So jobs change. Creativity changes things. But behind it, the anointing upon is there. Who would have thought that the, that, that, uh, the, the artifacts that would need to be built in Moses' tabernacle was people gifted by God? Bezali and Aholiah. Ah- it says, the Spirit of the Lord was upon them. They might not realize it was the Spirit of the Lord, but it was the Spirit of the Lord. So there is an anointing upon and anointing within. As you tap upon the love of God and touch the blessedness, it stirs the anointing within. It stirs the anointing upon. And each day, you launch into your anointing within, your anointing upon. And that's how your Christian life functions. And you think about it, if you had been doing that all your Christian life, your Christian life might have been different. But we have been rushing around like ants. We've been doing the exact thing. Instead of, he says, we once walked in the course of this world, but now we are seated in heavenly places. You see, it's position first. So, in the world, doing comes before being. You got to do, 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 then one day you will become somebody. You got to study, 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 one day you qualify, you become somebody. Correct? In the world, you do first, then you become. In the Lord, Being comes before doing. It's the opposite. And there is a secret to how you function in the world. You never say, I shall be. You say, I am. If the devil keeps telling you who you were, you say, I I was, but I am. I am who I am. By the grace of God, Paul says. It's you are. You are in the Lord. You are in Him. You are. As you affirm who you are in the Lord, things will begin to change. What will the devil challenge? He won't be challenging your works. He will challenge who you are. Think about it. He will say you are a failure. But you are a success in the Lord. He will say that you are a sinner, but you are a righteous person in God. He will say that uh, you are a backslidden person who can never overcome the problem, but in Christ you have overcome all things. Affirm your being, and then the doing comes. But a lot of us don't dare to affirm. See, cannot lie. I'm not used to it. I'm used to the way of the world. I'm like, do, 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 do. Then God says, ah, you have now qualified. But you and I have been qualified in Christ first. Receive, be, and then do. So we have to enter a state of being who we are in God. It's the very opposite of the world way the world functions. Before Joseph became a successful man, success was already on him. Before Daniel was recognized and became a chief minister, the chief minister anointing was already on him, bringing him to the place. The being comes before the doing. Before you're a successful businessman, the anointing to be a businessman must be affirmed and you know you are and you keep calling yourself the calling the things that be not as though they were, as though they are. And you call it to be so, at least in your own estimation in God. Now, on this earth, it's very hard, but every time you go into God's presence, God knows who you are and you hear God calling you those things, you will believe in what God believes in you. We are touching more next week. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. We thank you, Father, you have raised up a chosen people who will be successful in all that they set their hand unto. And not a single word that you have spoken to your people will fail to come to pass. You have said, 
that even the most little one of us will chase a thousand. We thank you, Father God, that you have caused the body of Christ to rise up to its perfection, to the glorious church. And Father, we grow up in a world where we have our own inner image damaged, hurt, slaughtered, and demoted, crucified, and attack in many ways until we come to you shattered and torn and broken but yet you say that those who come to you father god who tremble at your word you're able to rebuild repair restore and send us out as your very own thank you father god seal this into each one of our hearts so that we know who we are in you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's all rise together. And Father, this day we pronounce this blessing on your people. And even as we're going to pray in the Spirit for a while, see yourself for who you are. For Just have a moment in heaven, a few seconds of taste, to let the Lord minister who you are in Him. And every day you need to affirm who you are in Him before you do anything. Bin the Lord. Hunga Baha Seviriya Shinya Nalaha Mahama Bidiyanto Hungehinde Hanyandu Hale Ariande Nanalo Aniandu Enke Manga Hange Hunga Monga Masha Hunga Menga Homa Mama Shinde Nalaho Hunga Mahangi Hanganso Ne Haliana Honan de Neliano Hunga 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 Mosheriano The Lord has accepted you in his beloved. The Lord has called you before you were born. The Lord has gifted you. The Lord has talented you. That you may be all that he wants you to be. The Lord has gifted you and plays in your heart. The Lord has built himself a great and living house. You are the house that the Lord wants to live and he will live through you. He will live through you. The Lord has called you to high and mighty places to walk with Him in a heavenly place. The Lord will cause you to rest in His love. The Lord will set you on your feet again and you shall stand and stand with stand all oh, that the enemies cast against you for the Lord he sets your feet and you will never fail for he has become a great work in you. So let him finish, let him finish the work of the Lord in your life. Father, seal this work in each life. As we taste heaven, as we taste your acceptance, as we taste who we are, we come away from your presence assured, encouraged, blessed, sanctified, set apart to do and to be all that you want us to be and do. Thank you, Father. Let the outworking of all our lives always flow from your workmanship within us. Seal this into each life. In Jesus' name, and the Lord bless you 
the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and favor. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering. God bless each one of you.